the name of the thing is maximum entanglement in HEP. Okay? And uh, my first step is QED, tree level QED. Uh, so I will try to do a scattering of particles. We will play with which particle we have here, and we will see if there are, depending on the particles, we may have the S channel, we may have, we may have the T channel, and we may have the U channel. And uh, let's see if I generate entanglement. So the basic idea, as we did the other day, is this kind of thing. I start with a product state in helicities. I will take fermions, okay? Ciao. And I ask myself whether I end up with a state like that. And if this is so, I argue that the figure of merit for entanglement is twice alpha delta minus beta gamma, as I've been doing every day, okay? So I simply do the computation. And to do this computation, the first step is to realize that the key element is the discussion of the vertex. When we look at the vectors of QED, we have to see this thing. So I now look in detail what happened to the helicities and to the, how they combine, combine into the virtual photon, okay? So how they couple. And what you see is that the current given to helicities is proportional to the electric charge. And then you have some spinners, V prime, gamma, sigma, some some incoming uh, uh, particles, okay, with S and S prime helicities. To give an example, uh, I can take that the two incoming particles are in the Z direction, and I choose my, my, my Carroll representation, or whatever representation you want. I, all the details, by the way, are in the thesis of Alba, Cervera, Rierta. So this is, and this is 19, well, that's it. So let me look then in detail. So if I, I take the incoming and I take on the third direction, what I see is that RL is minus 2E, P0, 0, 0, minus 1, minus I, 0. Uh, and if I take the other, L, L, R, everything is identical, except that I have a change of sign in the third guy. Okay? It's so identical, but this change. But then I see a hint of what may happen. So I may start with one product state with L, R. I couple to the photon. But the fact that the, the difference is this, I can see immediately that when the, the same current, uh, sorry, the photon hits the outgoing currents, there will be some democracy and that the two guys will have an overlap with the outgoing state, which is not zero. So does it make sense? So the fact that the change of left, right to right, left is only a change of sign, okay, here, in the case of the outgoing, it will be more complicated because I will have all the dependencies in angular momentum. But they have a hint. It is that they have overlap, both of them, with the photon that will arrive. So I have an intuition. I may enter with a product state. I will have some circular um, polarization, but this polarization will have overlap with both right, left, and left, right, okay? So then, 
right left will go into a superposition of right left and left right, and therefore I may have entanglement. So how to do that in more detail? Well, that's an exercise that probably everybody here has done it at some point, which is a computation with ellipticities. If you do it at high energies, so high energy, E plus E minus, going to E plus E minus, I have only this channel. And then the solution is the following. LR goes to cosinus of theta minus 1, LR plus cosinus of theta plus 1, right, left. Okay? So the intuition is what I said, no? You have this overlap. And, uh, it depends on the kinematics, on the angle. So is there an angle where I manage to get maximum entanglement? Well, using the figure of merit here, I only need beta and gamma here, the others are zero. I need them to be equal. Then I have an equal superposition of right, left, left, right, and then I have maximal entanglement. So is this coefficient identical to this for any angle? Indeed, for theta equal pi, pi halves is when I do have that L right goes to a superposition of minus plus I left. The global, uh, the global norm normalization is immaterial for entanglement, okay? It's a global factor. So what counts uh, this global factor is discounted by normalization of the state. So what matters is the relative phase, okay? So I don't need to write all these dependencies of E square and all these things. Not again, that this computation, I do not integrate of a, a final helicities. Remember that the purpose uh, in quantum information is to look at the wave function, not at the observable. So I don't take the squares and I don't do these things. So the answer is yes. There is a process, a fundamental process in QED that would take two particles which are not entangled at all, zero entanglement, and they would become maximally entangled, not entangled, but maximally entangled. And if I were able now to put apparatus, measurement apparatus on the outgoing particles, and I could, as an experimenter, change the basis, okay? I could measure a belt test, I could, okay? But the basis is there. So, good. So, what about other processes? So why don't we consider E minus, E minus, So here, this argument does not work. Because in E minus, E minus, I don't have that property. I have, I have the T and U channels, okay? So this idea that uh, entanglement is, generation, is generated by the democratic uh, attitude of the photon versus the outgoing two particles is no longer there. I don't have that mechanism. So what is the possibility that we don't generate entanglement between electrons? That sounds a little bit peculiar because we see entanglement in nature, so something could happen. So can we do the computation? Now this computation saves you every possible detail, but I, I think it is worth having it explicitly. Uh, and I do it no longer at high energy, so I have to complete uh, three-level result. And what I do is I, I do the computation, and I see that this goes into minus 2, minus m square, p square, c square, s square, minus, minus m square, p square. All that times LR. Now I have a very similar guy with a few modifications, minus minus 2, minus m squared, p squared, s squared, c squared. 
and this goes to the right left. And finally, I have m p zero over p square c two minus s two c s l l plus by right. Okay. Well, the first observation is I, I see that the product state contains all the elements, so there is hope that I can get a figure of merit for entanglement not, not zero. So I can see that this may happen, okay? But let me look for maximal entanglement. So can two electrons at the very fundamental level, at the QED level, get entangled? And uh, as before, the natural thing is pi halves. So when the scattering particles uh, go in the transversal direction, okay? And in this particular case, C is the cosinus of theta halves, and in this particular case, and S is the sinus of theta halves. So if I had pi fours, C and S are identical. There are cancellations of all the left, left, right, right, and it turns out that left, right only goes to the combination of left, right, and right, left. So it's pointing towards the singlet or the, well, a maximal entangled state. And this is really, or oh, I think it is really nice. In this particular kinematics, if I do uh, the mass zero limit, I lose the masses, uh, and I have CS and I reconstruct on the Mandelstam variables, it turns out that this is T square U square T4 plus U4. It's a, it's a very symmetric result. Okay, it's only depending on the Mandelson variables that you get this thing, okay? So it's, and this is, uh, sorry, this is for every angle, okay? It's at mass zero. But if I go, and this is what is not trivial, to theta pi halves, okay? Then I get one for every momenta. Well, so that means that two electrons, if I look at the scattering in the transversal direction, are always maximally entangled, okay? Always. It's not a function of the momentum, okay? So this is working at low energies. If I repeat this computation of the E plus E minus at low energies, I don't get maximal entanglement, okay? I don't. This is in, at high energies. So it turns out E plus E minus is very different from E minus E minus. E plus E minus manages to get maximum entanglement in the tree level at high, high, high energies, but E minus E minus, the two electrons, can get maximally entangled even at low energies, okay? So why is it so? If I look in detail, at this computation, it turns out that one of the lines comes from this guy because left preserves to left and, uh, and the others is a cross. So actually the two lines that add up are precisely the two diagrams. And having the very same coefficient for the two diagrams and therefore having maximal entanglement, that means that they are indistinguishable. So at the heart of the electron-electron entanglement is indistinguishability, okay? This is the heart. Whereas in the S-channel is the fact that you couple to a photon and the photon likes both possibilities of left, right, and right, left. So the two mechanisms to generate entanglement are radically different. S-channel is democratic coupling of the photon T and U channel is indistinguishability of the two channels. Each channel separately would not produce any entanglement, okay? And I think it's a remarkable fact because what is the low energy model to describe the interaction of two spins at low energies eh, in condensed matter? This is uh, the Heisenberg model. And the Heisenberg model, okay, you you simply write sigma for the one particle dot sigma for the second particle. And that Hamiltonian 
turns out to have as a, as a fundamental state a maximally entangled state, uh, the singlet. So the very fact that QED is entangling at every energy is behind the idea that the natural low energy realization uh, is a Heisenberg model and allows for, for maximal entanglement. It's like matching perfectly these things, okay? Is it, is it clear? So, I don't know if there are questions. Huh? Yeah, please. Yes. From the, t from the T channel and the U channel, the fact that, in, that the result is, is that these two electrons cannot be distinguished. So that means that final state is uh, anti-symmetric between the, the In this particular case, yeah, you, I, I don't know. Well, I didn't write it. Well, I write it in this way, but you are correct. There is a, a, a sign, okay? Uh, so, so are you happy with that or not? Okay. I, you know, I've been working in physics for years and I never knew why entanglement. <laughs> <laughs> you do a computation and you get it, okay? Why don't we go beyond? And now I, I will get controversial, so please kill me with moderation, okay? Uh, I will take, yeah, please. Actually, I have a question. In this uh, first case of the electron positron, um, so the, the, the initial state, it does not evolve uh, with the S matrix. No, it's a pure state. I, I'm taking a, you know, a, a density matrix is the right mechanism to describe an insufficient classical preparation, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the density matrix. So because I'm looking at the essence of how entanglement is generated, I don't do that. I, I, that would be adding noise to the discussion, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming the state is a pure state. I mean, okay, the product with, state. Yeah. with the the identity of the of the evolution of the S matrix yes. does not play a role in no. this. Uh, this is the the interacting part, the T part of the S matrix. Okay, this is the this is when you have entanglement. Okay? Right, because the uh, when you have interaction. Sorry. Right, yeah. because the the state yeah. evolves with with the identity. Yeah, I understand, but. Uh, so you are concentrating in the T part, okay? Identity plus IT on the T part, on the interaction part of, the, of this. When there is interaction, does interaction generate entanglement? This is the answer, okay? Okay. Okay. So as I said, let me now be controversial. Yeah, sure. So it's a post selection of this particular angle where I see the maximum entanglement. If not, it is not maximum. When you measure, of course, you, if the measurement is destructive, uh, you kill the system. No, I mean, this is a different issue. How measurements are done huh? it might be destructive entanglement. In high energy physics, they are destructive. Okay. <laughs> After measuring, you don't have still the top uh, there or whatever, you, you kill it, it which is okay. Huh? Weak measurements are subtleties that you can do in quantum optics, but not in high energy physics. I simply measure, yeah. And you, you measure through Compton scattering of the outgoing particles. So the right way to do that is that the left guy has a different distribution of angles on the Compton scattering in the further detector, and then you reconstruct the thing, and, and then you see this, okay? So, sure. So you said that normalization doesn't matter. Mm. So could a thing to do this with gravity, and learn something about gravity? gravity? Uh, say that again? Please. Yeah, could a think about a scattering with a graviton through neutral, neutral okay. particles and investigate? Well, may I? respond to that later because I will sure. be coming up, 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 and I will come to gravity. Okay, okay? thanks. So, and now it's a spoiler. Well, don't you feel enticed to analyze everything now? 
really. I mean, don't you feel, oh, I want to check everything. Well, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, e minus, mu minus. I don't do it. Uh, sorry. E plus E minus to E minus mu minus to E minus mu minus. So electron mu to electron mu. What do you think? Can you entangle them? No way, because the electron has to go electron, the muon muon, there is no T channel. And you only have one channel, they cannot be superposition. So E minus E, e minus mu minus, okay, does not generate entanglement. Okay. What about Compton? What about photon with the diagrams? Eh? What what everything? Do you think Compton would generate entanglement between the helicity and the polarization? That's also a valid uh, figure of merit, no? I'm entangling degrees of freedom from a fermion to a photon. Do you think Compton would generate entanglement? It does, okay? You have to check and you see it does. So, so let me then uh, be more controversial and read the, read the beautiful essays of John Archibald Wheeler. In the 80s and 90s. And uh, he, he wrote the following sentence. I will write it like uh, in the American movies that the people write the sentences in the blackboard, okay? He said, all things physical are informatic, theoretic, information theoretic, I want to be precise, in origin. So, Wheeler, who was behind the, he was the director of Zurich on, on the no cloning theorem. He was the guy who invented the word post selection. He was the guy who invented the word wormhole. Okay. He was deeply interested in gravity. Mm -hmm. He, after these years of, of understanding all these things, in particular the no cloning theorem had a fantastic effect. Huh? Yesterday, I mentioned that no cloning is behind no signaling. Huh? If I, I could clone, I can set up a mechanism whereby Alice and Bob communicate faster than light. Okay? No cloning is there. So no cloning is about not copying information. So it's like nature has been shaped in such a way that certain tasks are impossible. Certain tasks which have a, an element of discussion which is information theory. So he came with this idea, everything physical ultimately has to be understood as an information process. So it's reverting the ideas of 1930s where Post and Church realized that computing is doing a physical process. That's why computers consume energy, okay? That's why you need to reset the computers. That's why you have a Turing machine as a, as a paradigm of how you do computation. So this is the reverse. So the idea became known as it from bit, okay? Now, in the modern way, it from qubit, okay? Even there is a consortium of people in America that took that as the name of the consortium, it from qubit. So, come on, why don't we analyze that? So can we take seriously this thing? I think that maybe the ultimate principles of physics are not those that we are using now, but there might be a different set of principles, okay? And those principles should be, the element should be information. So why not thinking in the following way? Is QED a special? in some quantum information way. Is there something in QED? Well, we are saying that it generates maximum entanglement, okay? So maximum entanglement is not amount to the 
would be possibility of carrying an experiment of the Bell test. But essentially, it says that there is a state with maximum entropy, maximum surprise for the subparties. And uh, that is the sine qua non condition to be away from classical physics. So in a way, if we push very hard and we say QED should be able to generate maximum entanglement, we are saying QED should not be classical, should be quantum. Okay, so it's a different principle. So why QED is quantum? Well, you could impose that. So the exercise I will propose you and I will do for you uh, is really just trying a very small thing. So I will do the following. I will take QED, but I will extend QED. So instead of taking QED as psi i is like psi minus one fourth of f mu nu f mu nu, I think that carefully, you remember that the heart of y s channel couple was the, the, the vertex. So here in the vertex, let me touch it. Let me change the vertex of QED because then I know I'm changing entanglement. Okay? So what I do is the following. Instead of taking the usual vertex, okay, which is gamma mu, well, I change this. So I'm changing to another matrix the coupling between the helicities and the polarization. I'm changing that. Of course, I'm changing all the entanglement properties. That's obvious. Now, those are 16 matrices, and I want to preserve a number of symmetries to reduce the problem, the problem to something which is computable. So let me do the following. G mu, it's a 16, okay, it's, it's, a, it's like a Clifford-like uh, uh, algebra, but uh, I can expand it. No, I, I can take, um, I can take A mu nu, gamma nu, plus A mu, identity, a mu 5, gamma 5, plus A mu nu 5, mu nu 5, gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma 5, plus the anti-commutator of these guys. Okay? This is nothing. This is choosing a basis. Okay? There's no nothing there. It's, you can always expand any of these matrix in all these elements space from the Clifford algebra. Okay, it's a, it's a basis. And now I check at CPT, let me preserve CPT. So if I preserve CPT, all of these are zero, but here I have 16 numbers which are undefined. Okay, it's a fact. So I'm restricting the problem to have something doable. And here now, and I refer to you to the thesis of Alba because the number of appendices tends to infinity. Uh, I do every possible computation at three level, every possible computation. And I check, I check the following. I check what is the delta, so the figure of merit for entanglement for the Baba scattering. I do it for the Compton. I do it for per annihilation. I do it for Mott. I do it for Muller. I do it for all of them. Okay? And I maximize the violation with respect to a menu. So I don't know. QED is one particular choice. Okay? But I have a space of 16 dimensions. QD is a number, it's one point. In a space of 16 dimensions, one point. Okay? And I, I do. What may happen? Well, what may happen is that one experiment wants these to be more entangled, but then at the cost of not having entanglement in the other. So there might be a conflict of these things. Or there might be a line of theories which is equally entangled. May happen anything. Well, when you do it, uh, just for you to have a 
hint uh, that this is not completely trivial. Uh, I don't know, well, I, I will not do it. I was about to write to you uh, one of the scattering, e plus, e minus, to mu plus, mu minus, in particular in terms of the a's, and you will see the complicated structure, and you would see, indeed, that there is a maximization to be done over there. So I am saving that for you. So the final result is the following, is that uh, the four matrices turn out to be plus minus gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, okay? That is QED, okay? Uh, there are double signs that cannot be fixed because all these processes are two, have two vertices. So the square, you cannot see it, okay? And there are fake solutions that are not discarded by this. This is what one of them has a different sign. Okay, so the first result is that all the A's are one, okay, as they should be, the, the, the QED thing, but there are ambiguities in designs, and this is because all the processes analyzed are two-body with two fermions. In order to fix that, you should explore scatterings which are not with the two fermions. So, furthermore, those points are isolated. So if you go a little bit beyond there, you don't have maximum entanglement. So it's really uh, pinpointing at the solution. And there are no incompatibilities, okay, on top of that. So it's a real thing. You really get maximum entanglement. So all things considered, I could tell you, you can as well postulate gauge symmetry, or you can as well postulate maximum entanglement. Solution is uh, the same essentially. Okay, so this is an example where I substitute, I go to it from qubit, I eat from maximum entanglement, but maximum entropy. And my principle that dominates the construction of the theories is maximum entropy. Okay, I gave this lecture at CERN, a few people kill me. Why? I don't know. I mean, what's wrong with doing your computation? But um, uh, it follows, yeah, I was about to say that it follows that therefore I may argue at a higher level that it is not that I want maximum entanglement, it's that I want Bell inequalities to be able to be violated and therefore I want the world to be quantum, not classical. I postulate the world is quantum. I need this kind of thing. Yeah. Earlier on, you removed all of these other terms saying that you were you wanted to maintain CPT. Yeah. I, I think you you meant maintain yeah, yeah. separately C and P and T, yeah. is that so, right? Sorry, C separate from P, separate from P, yeah. No, but we know that there are interactions for which that's well, not true. And This is the next page. Okay, okay? fine. Yeah. <laughs> I will get to gravity, so one step at a time, I will get to gravity, yeah. So, so you said uh, you maximize these yeah. combinations. One question is which one was important and also yeah. do you also maximize, what, what did you do for the moment? No, the point is that every one of them is related to different A. The A minus, so each A minus is maximized by different guys. Okay. And because they don't come all together in the same, I give you uh, uh, just because th th then you see it much better. If I do E plus E minus to mu plus mu minus, the entanglement figure here requires uh, to build a matrix which is A dot A transpose, and this is A mu nu, A nu mu, and when I have the A, it turns out that A two two, A one three, minus A one two, A two three, must be zero. If this happens, this process has maximal entanglement. So you see I have a constraint on these matrices. Each one adds constraint, in such a way that the final solution is QED. So w when you say this is maximum entanglement, mm -hmm. so you, ma you also optimize momentum configuration? Yeah, this is, I go always to the best configuration possible. This is the same as the S channel, no? This is S channel only. So this is for theta pi halves and high energies, okay? Okay. When you do that computation, it turns out, I, I do have the amplitude, I don't want to write it in detail, but you have the amplitude with all the A's, you look at the combination 
that we are using all the time, and then when they match, you have this thing, and this is a constraint. Okay. Now, each one is a different constraint. It turns out that the global minimum exists, and it is QED. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> okay so, yeah, Marco. Uh, it seems even stronger to invariant, right, because I can always add the magnetic moment that is gauge invariant to the... Correct. Why you say but you, you, you don't have a magnetic yeah, moment. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't say so because I, I take as a hypothesis that I only have this coupling. I've discarded the magnetic moment. Okay. So your, your question would be I would restart adding another piece right. and there. Okay. But you don't know. No, I don't. Well, that would be interesting to. That would be interesting. Would be more far yeah, far. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, can I. You know, we did a complete thesis. I mean, you don't know how many computations we did here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please. In the, in the last one, how do you remove the term, which is the commutator of the two gamma matrix? Because this is the dipole operator. Oh, the C, P, and T kill all these guys. Uh. They kill that. You can check that only the first survives. OK, so I gave this lecture many years ago in, uh, at CERN. And as I said, I remember a guy who got so angry. You don't understand anything. OK. So, but there was Veneziano in the audience. And the first question he asked is, can you say anything about universality of the families? So is the charge for the electron the same as the charge for the mu? If you look in detail, the processes, the entanglement, if the two charges were different, you don't change the, the entanglement in any process. So this is blind to the universality of the charge. Okay? You cannot say anything. Okay? This is the first result. But Veneziano asked a question. Why instead of fixing the interaction, okay, maybe there are parameters in the standard model that modifies entanglement? Okay? Uh, and then I, well, are there? And, and how does it work? So indeed, then we did the following. Said, oh man, it is right. I may now have, uh, you know, I may have E plus E minus with a photon. I may have a Z. I may have other processes. Try to understand how this calculation is done. Yeah. Uh, so, when you added all these G mat matrices, okay, and when you compute the tree-level diagram, you have a photon propagator. Mm -hmm. So I look at the way you compute the amplitude, I yeah. suppose you just replace the photon propagator with the G mu nu, yeah. the contraction? Yeah, this is what I did. Okay, yeah. but, but because I'm fact, not fixing any gauge because I'm not thinking No, but the fact that you're adding all these uh, uh, vertices, it, you, you're breaking gauge inverse. How do you justify Replacing well, your photon I propagator agree. with GMU. Th this is the criticism. I, yeah, I, and, and I'm because not, you don't have uh, don't current have conservation. Invariance. You don't have current conservation, exactly. I don't have anything. But so in your tree level calculation, you are actually secretly assuming gauge invariance because you're I'm, replaced by GMU new. I'm so I really don't, don't see. Yeah, that's exactly the criticism. So I'm having some assumptions here. And the assumption is that I keep the kinetic term of the photon. So I'm assuming the kinetic So the only thing I'm touching is the vertex. That's the only thing. And then I break uh, gate symmetry. So I grade. No, no, no. The photon propagator is on the right. So I'm taking the vertex. But what I'm saying is I only ch photon kinetic term, tree level, I take the photon. What I'm changing is this. It's this. And then I agree with you, it's this particular thing. Okay? The word identities, they are separate word identities. Okay? The word identity for the other guy is there. This is not. And you're right. So I'm computing something that does not make sense in a theory where you claim gauge symmetry is essential. And in this theory, which is not gauge invariant, okay, it's not. Therefore, you won't believe in it. I recompute everything and I check if there is a point where entanglement is maximum. And I find it. And then it's exactly when you recover the gate symmetry. Okay. 
Now, the assumptions have to be clear. I have a term that I'm not touching. I may touch this term if you want. I'm not doing that. I'm keeping the photon propagating straight. I'm changing this vertex. And if I change the vertex, I change entanglement. And I'm just making an observation. There is one point where you recover maximum entanglement. And this is gauge symmetry. Now, you may argue that this is a given, that gauge symmetry is so nice that, of course, it wants to have equal superposition of things. You may argue in this direction. OK? Yeah? It's an exercise. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that I'm using this theory away from QED to do multi-loop computations where I will have all sorts of inconsistencies if I don't have case theory. I understand that. I'm just saying, at three level, where is the maximum entropy point? And to analyze that space, I open the possibility that they are, the coupling is modified. And then it, it's an isolated point. It's an observation. It's a pure observation. Yeah. OK. So let me do, forget the Z. So let me take the weak interactions. And then I'm not changing anything there. So no complaints about <laughs> I'm not changing the standard model. So I take the coupling. OK. And, uh, but now I think that these numbers are given by nature. So these numbers are not fixed by, we have a freedom to have a theta w, which is what we measure these things. We fix, we have a theory, we go to the experiments, we get numbers, and we fix these parameters, OK? So this is what we do. But they are not given by, by any principle. They are given by nature. OK, so the idea is, can I play with some of these things and check whether there is a preferred value where I would have more entanglement? OK, now, as I said, I'm not changing the structure of the theory. You're only playing in the space of parameters of the theory. Well, the, it's a long story, but I will tell you only the, the I will tell you that the place where the things are easier to analyze is in the decay of the Z. Okay, and then you have uh, these things going like that. Well, we have all of the others, M1 going to the same thing, plus, plus, minus, minus, and then we have minus root of 2C, M, GF, well, we have all the decays. And then you wonder whether the decay is maximally entangled in some particular angle, in some particular value of these numbers. Of course, the coupling constants okay, uh, appear in the two terms when you decay. In this particular case, uh, well, they appear in, in a way that then I multiply using the concurrence, and I get a result. Now, this result is a little bit long to write, but I could write it in detail. And the question is, is there a place where, where these things happen? And uh, the observation is a, a very obvious observation. It is that, uh, well, I write it. So the figure of entanglement now becomes a very complicated thing. Okay? It's minus x squared, g a squared plus g v squared. There is a beta squared. There is a xi. Well, I I said I will write it everything, but I'm now considering that it's too long. Okay, and there is a denominator. Okay, here. So and my mu is m f divided by m z, and my x is the square root of one minus m f squared m z. So it's a mathematical problem. I mean, can I get a 1 here? And um, there is a 1. And it may be trivial for you. But it is when the sinus square of theta w is 1 fourth. OK? So this is when this is maximized. 
So this is 0.25, and nature is not very far, so nature is around 0.23. So if you look in detail, well, that's the reason. Now, so nature is very close to have the maximal entanglement for the decay. Now, is this obvious? Well, I think it is obvious because the reason why this happens is that the solution comes, this point corresponds to GV equals zero. So you have maximum violation of, of the parity. So there you have another trick. So it's about being eigenvalues of the parity that produces this thing, this superposition. So this hints at that entanglement is deeply related to how you implement parity. And there is a mathematical point. Now, nature has not chosen 0.25. <laughs> it's a way, OK? Not very far away. So, and there is nothing more than that. I mean, I, I cannot say any, any more thing than that. Tell me. Yeah, but this is a tree level thing, OK? Yeah, you are right. So we did the computation of one loop, and, uh, but you can immediately see that the running of this parameter will never get to the other. So I don't see any way that it will go into the right solution, okay, in perturbation theory. It is not far, okay? Okay. So may I ask now whether all the processes in QED that they add uh, weak contributions. So my argument in QED changes. And again, it's a beautiful thing that no. In every process where I have a new contribution, and this is not obvious because if I have the Z contribution, the two terms in the superposition, both of them get an addition. Yet, the, it maintains the relation that they are equal and therefore maximal entanglement. So there is no destructive interference of the weak sector when you look at entanglement. Okay. There is no, it could happen, but it doesn't happen. GV is zero. GV. Yeah. It's a mathematical solution for that. Now, and now I come back to, to the ideas of, okay, why don't you analyze in general what happens in quantum field theory with maximum entanglement beyond the standard model? And, uh, we did a number of things. We did the analysis of color, although they are not asymptotic states we analyze, and color turns out to be, again, maximally entangled by QCD. We did, uh, there are theories that you cannot do anything. You have scalars, you cannot do anything. I've never had the, have the energy to go into analyzing the, Kobayashi, the, the, the relation between the, well, the kobayashi maskawa matrix and the masses. Because it turns out that when you look at uh, certain diagrams, you have like the ratio coming. And because they come with different sides of the equality, you have this feeling that maybe the hierarchies would, be, would have something to say about that. Right? And they come in a very specific combination. I've never, we have never done the, the computation. People have asked me at, IF, uh, at EFT in Madrid whether we could use that for ultraviolet completion of theories. So we have anomaly matching as a principle to match theories at different scales. So the question is how you go from one scale to the other. Would maybe a principle of that the entropy is either maintained or change in some direction, a monotonicity of, of this could be uh, some principle. And coming back to gravitons, okay, so we are starting to do the computation whether graviton-graviton interaction can maximally entangle gravitons, and uh, the first result, although it is not published, is that it is possible. And even with a little subtlety, in gravity you have, you have these kind of diagrams, no? You have these diagrams, but you have the fourth vertex, like in QCD, okay? You could say that maybe there is a relation, a magic relation between the, the couplings that guarantees maximum entanglement, and the answer is no. Huh? Whatever the relation, both terms contribute, 
and they don't spoil the maximum entanglement. So again, maximum entanglement cannot tell you the expansion of gravity. Okay? It cannot tell you that. It is, it is insufficient to fix that. Okay. Uh, Okay, I would like to, to finish saying that there are other people doing, exploiting quantum information in different ways for uh, beyond the standard model. Uh, and I, I would like to mention all these ideas of Preskill on the emergence of space-time and other people before him. Uh, they use absolute maximum entanglement to describe that space-time. But then I would like to mention also this idea that black holes are uh, fastest scramblers on the firewall. Uh, so what happens is that the dynamics there immediately scramble, so maximally entangle the, the particles, and you get your relation with that you had with other particles. So that there are ideas related to entanglement which are used actively used in different fields of of physics. Okay, and uh, well, I'm. This is my conclusion now. So what is new? in the last 20 years is that entanglement uh, and all the ideas of quantum information have put the wave function on the table rather than the Hamiltonians. And uh, entanglement is seen as a resource. We have a more, also not only fundamental way of understanding things, but we have a more utilitarian way of understanding things. So we can do things, we can do protocols. Uh, and whether Entanglement is to be playing any role in the ultimate constraints of what is the theory of the universe. It remains to be open, and I, I like this idea that it might come from qubit. Okay. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, then, us for the nice lecture. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, it's Fami speaking. Who? Uh, uh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I could not be there <laughs> this morning. Thanks so much for your inspiring lecture. Um, I have a question for uh, uh, Jan and, and you, so well, because uh, yeah. during Jan's presentation, uh, he was arguing to follow the principle of uh, minimal entanglement uh, uh. to define a, a theory. And because the idea that if you want to have a symmetry, then you want to minimize the entropy, and then you want to go into a minimal entanglement. Today you have presented a, another principle, if you want, or another idea to follow, where you actually look for maximal entanglement. So I, you know, can, can you, can you go, can you guys, uh, you two, uh, yeah. argue for yeah. one or the other or both? I don't know. Uh, I'm a bit confused by that. I surrender I immediately. I surrender yeah. immediately. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Have to switch off. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I surrender. I don't fight myself. No, uh, the QD indefinitely is maximum because the minimum would be the identity. The identity would. So having the, all the, all the uh, helicities not talking to each other, it would be diagonal and you would never generate from left, right, anything but left, right. So bosonic theories don't, don't, don't do that. So in the particular case of QD, it's maximum entanglement for sure, okay? not minimal. Minimal has a trivial solution of no, no interaction between the degrees of freedom. Okay. Yeah. Uh. Well, I would like to see you here in the room, Fabio, before I speak. No? No, anyway, I, 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 I think this is a very interesting proposal, and, and I, I think we are talking about different things because uh, the case that we study is for global symmetry, whereas you're looking at the case symmetry. So mm -hmm. I would just leave it. Yeah, I there. think uh, what you, I mean, the principle of maximum surprise, it's a principle, so apply it to whatever. So whether it will fix anything, global symmetries local symmetries, parameters of it to be explored. And very likely there is no solution as, although it is very, 
tantalizing. <laughs> I mean, come on, 25. I mean, <laughs> you are not far. So it's a fact. So it's a fact. If you go to the ZDKs, you would see almost maximum attack. It's a fact. So that, it would not be so if the parameters are different. Okay. So is it that surprising to some extent? I would just add one quick comment, and which you actually alluded to yeah. uh, in the very beginning, that you know, in the case of E plus E minus going to E plus E minus, the mechanism for maximum entanglement is because you have a S channel diagram, and then you have universal coupling to the different state, and then in the E E minus E minus to E minus minus, again you you pointed out is because these are identical particles. Yeah. So, so one could just generate maximum entanglement based on these two observations without referring to gauge symmetry. Because in fact, we, we, we have scalar theories that precisely uh, we can generate uh, maximum entanglement in terms of the flavor quantum number instead of the helicities. Uh, and it's the same mechanism. If you have an S-channel diagram, universal coupling to different flavor state, you generate maximum entanglement. Yeah, absolutely. And in this sense, you don't have to invoke gauge symmetry. Yeah, yeah that's just uh, my absolutely quick comment. Absolutely agreement on that. So in every context, you have to formulate what you want to touch and see that there is a relation. Yeah, right. it's very clear. As Anna said, I mean, I was very tantalized to go to the Kobayashi Maskawa matrix and see these diagrams, but they are very involved and <sighs> solutions were not easy. But there, there is something to be said between the relation of masses and the angles. And there is something to be said. To, to explore the space, to see if there is a corner of the space where you have more entanglement. Yeah, yeah maybe I have a question, a naive question on the computational side of it. <clears throat> mm. So everything here at, let's say, three level, it's something yeah. you can write on, on, the, on the blackboard. Uh, do you think is there any in inefficiency in the way we simulate data with Monte Carlo? Because essentially yesterday you say there is a corner in the Hilbert space when we are able to simulate everything with tensor network or something that has low entanglement. So for, for some f point in the phase space when the entanglement is maximally, yeah. so we, we should use something that has essentially quantum computing power to simulate this. Do you, do you think any kind of potential direction yeah, yeah. in computation. I, I, we talked before, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, there is a generic statement that, that not all states are equal. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fact. Now, if you want to generate something that has more or less entanglement, your tools have to be different. Little entanglement you can simulate with many techniques, many, okay? That's why you have Monte Carlo simulations of, of many theories. As soon as you go to to frustration or theories like the spin liquid uh, uh, or frustration in the, or even the Hopper model into why, how come that the simulations in Monte Carlo are so difficult? Why don't we get good numbers? Because you can see that the state is much more entangled. Okay? It's dramatically more entangled. So of course your, your method of, of computing never was adapted to entanglement. It was invented in a different context. So can, your question is, can if we know what we're simulating, and we know that there is entanglement. Can we use better techniques to do that? Of course, yes, I agree. And yesterday it was not mentioned in the Monte Carlo thing, but it, I agree with you. I mean, why does make to use a quantum computer to do Monte Carlo? Because there are cases that you generate may require a lot of entanglement. And therefore you need a quantum computer, not a classical quantum. So it's not that a quantum computer can do anything by default, this is wrong. And many computations. You know, to add three and four, I don't even need a pencil. <laughs> so the, the, tar the instrument you use to attack the, to attack the problem depends on the complexity of the problem. Uh, quantum computers will play a role for sure. Okay? For sure. By the other, way, we, uh, you will see this afternoon on a demo, no? Yeah. On a real computer connected from <laughs> here and running something. Uh, so it's very nice. Any other questions from Zoom also? Okay. No, from, I was asking if there was some question from Zoom. From Zoom? Mm -hmm. No. I wanted to ask about in, uh, including loops uh, in the calculation you've done in for QAD now because well, you add loops, you 
you generate a term that it's like the commutator of the gamma mu gamma nu that you have in that GMU. So I'm asking if you start including a term like that at the three level Lagrangian, uh, how does this change the picture? Yeah. Can you infer something yeah. interesting about it? So the first thing is uh, in a natural way, uh, I would, the, my first answer would be renormalize properly, and, and you work on the renormalized amplitude. Okay, and then again, you have superpositions. Okay, but your question is goes to the heart. If you believe in it from qubit, it's about violating Bell inequalities. So why don't you, instead of taking the amplitude, you simply go to the Bell, uh, to the Bell inequality, and that's unobservable. So all things considered, after renormalization, this is a prediction from the model. So use this principle right away on the ultimate thing, on the Bell inequality. So ask the theory to be maximally non-local. And that would, you understand, no? The, the, this being an observable, okay, you will have to work through the renormalization program to finally get to the output. But there will be a prediction from, from humans given that theory. And then that prediction has a structure and you want that to be maximally violating. And that would be the solution. That's the answer for me if I go to higher loops. Hmm? You know, may I say that perturbation theory in high energy physics, you, we, you may talk about particles, but th this is a human construction. You know, if we had any method to solve QD without that, like the lattice, you would not talk about loops, okay? Yeah. This is an artifact of the fact that we don't have a method to solve the theory in an exact way. We have it perturbative. So, Forget about the fact that we are expanding, because this is what we can now, today, with the standard model. Think that you have the machinery. Okay, then the test would be the Bell test. And that would be the ultimate formulation of the principle. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. Any more questions? If not, let's thank uh, Jose Ignacio again. Thank you.